All right, guys, if you got a Bible, open it up to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we'll get into this subject called the day of the Lord and what it all means, the day of the Lord. Let's pray, shall we? Dear Father, we just come before you and we just thank you so much for bringing us together this morning. We thank you that your word is perfect, that through your word we can uh, we, we can be illuminated, uh, taught about the things that are to come. And so, Father, we ask that this morning you would just teach us about this subject called the Day of the Lord. And we ask that you would just uh, let us learn about these things. We thank you that your word is not silent concerning the future. And that, Lord, that you um, bring all things to light. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So as you know, 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians is written to a church in the city of Thessalonica in Greece. And these guys are being, just received the gospel in such a great way. They received the gospel in such a hardcore, awesome way that Paul was blown away by them. And, and when, he was, uh, when he was there, he was just like, man, he was shocked by how solid these guys are in the things of the Lord. And they received the gospel, they were growing, they were learning. But you know, and you, we, we talked about and how we studied, these guys were persecuted. People did not like the fact that they were becoming Christians. And the Gentile world, the Romans there, uh, the Grecian people, decided just to really go off on this Thessalonican church. And when they hit the Thessalonians, they hit them hard. And the persecution was, was tense. We see this in the book of Acts, chapter 17, when they get, first get saved. It was so bad, Paul had to run away. He was only there for a maximum of one month. And when he ran, he was always concerned about how they were doing. In the book of 1 Thessalonians, the letter, you see that when he wrote that letter, it was like, man, this is hardcore. You guys, hang on, hang on. And they had that persecution and pressure that was constantly going on in their church. But then we also noticed that when Paul was there, he taught them so much. And one of the greatest things that they, that they were taught by Paul was the fact of end times, the rapture, the day of the Lord, the tribulation. We don't have those Bible studies, but we know that they were pretty hardcore and they were pretty in-depth and they were taught these things very well. But we know because of these persecutors, they came in and they really, how can I say it? It's like the persecutors of the Thessalonican church woke up every morning and says, what can we do? What can we do to just tick those Christians off? And they were, they even had so much as people writing false forged letters saying that they were from Paul, telling the church in Thessalonica that they missed the rapture and that they're in the tribulation, it really stinks to be you. And the really original fake news, you know, just like, oh my gosh, this is horrible. This is horrible. And they were freaking out. They were uh, distressed. And so Paul is writing this second Thessalonian letter just to let them know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is not from us. And let me reaff reaffirm what is from us. And so in chapter 2, he's talking to these persecuted Christians about the last days, okay? And one of the greatest themes of the Thessal both 1 and 2 is this concept of the last days. And so in verse 1 of chapter 2, it says this, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us as though the day of the Lord had come. Now, Paul wants to clear things, these things up about the second coming and the rapture of the church. In fact, look at verse 1 here. It says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
one thing, and the gathering together to him, the second thing. We know that the gathering together with him is what we call the rapture of the church. Now, he went into detail in that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and it was a great study about the rapture of the church, or also known as the day of Christ. It was really a neat study. We, I, I love that. But he wants to get into this, and, but he also is going to be talking about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the second coming. There's two events, two big events that are going to be awesome. But he goes into this thing in verse 2, and he says, not to be soon shaken. I don't want you to be freaked out. The word shaken there means someone comes up and is responsible for shaking you guys up. He's, he's gonna, it's like, the word picture there in the Greek is like someone, uh, it's kind of like an ant farm. Remember those things, the ant farms that we used to have back in the day? And you watch those ants make little tunnels? I remember I had a project one time. It was a great project. My first or second grade project, I forgot what it was, which one, and I had this whole display at the science fair of ants. I had an ant farm. I had, I had uh, um, poster boards up and dioramas and models and an actual ant farm. And I actually had this thing where you could hear me in my little voice describing the life of an ant and on this new thing called a Walkman. And it was, and, and you put it on and you hit play and then you rewind it. And, and I remember at the end of this, this night, I went back to get my ant farm and some jerk kid shook my ant farm. And those ants, were, I know, pitiful, isn't it? And those pitiful little ants, they were freaked out. They just, it, they, those ants like going, what did you do to us? What did, what's going on? They were running all over the place. Some were just, you know, some had jumped off the, the little farm there and committed suicide. It was horrible. It was a horrible time for my ants. But this is the thing. That word shaken is like being shook like an ant farm. You Thessalonian church have been shook. You have been rocked. Someone has messed with you. And they were. I mean, wouldn't it be horrible if you're going through immense persecution, horrific trial, losing jaws, being beaten? We know from history that they were being killed for their faith. And then all of a sudden you get a, a, you get a letter from a guy pretending to be Paul and says, you know what, I was wrong. We don't know what it said, but we can make the sense of it from these letters. You're in the day of the Lord. Yeah, I know I said that you were going to miss it, but guess what? You're in it. That'd be horrible. It's like not on top of the physical. Now I've got to deal with the spiritual ramifications of this. You, you guys get this? So they're shook. They're freaked out. In word, spirit, that means it was a spiritual attack. It was in, it's, people were talking to them about it. They were probably talking amongst themselves. And then they got this letter. He goes, oh, and they were soon shaken in mind and troubled. And by the spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us. It, it, it was, wasn't from us. It was as if it was from us, but it was from us. Though the day of Christ had come. Now, in the King James Bible and in the New King James Bible, they use the phrase, the day of Christ. But in the Greek, it's the day of the Lord. I encourage you to circle that word Christ in verse two and put a little arrow to the side that says Lord. In the Greek, it's the word day of the Lord. And that's what we're talking about here. It's not the day of Christ, that's something else. When they were translating the Bible from Greek or Latin into English in those 16, 19 days of King James, for some reason, those cats put in Christ instead of Lord. But the word that's used there is kurios in the Greek, which literally means Lord. So it's a mistranslation, not of the original text, but of our English translation. So that word there is day of the Lord, and that clears up a lot of confusion. We did, you have not missed the day, or you, you have, you're not in the day of the Lord. Uh, and, and so make sure you fix that in the margin of your Bible. They thought the persecution was so bad that they, were, they, they are now in the day of the Lord, that it has come, that they were in it. And really, this is a proof, really cool guys for you Bible students out there, listen up. This is a proof that Paul taught pre-trib rapture, that the rapture was going to happen before the tribulation, that Jesus was going to take his church out of this world before the tribulation. How do, how do I know this? 
Because if Paul taught that the church was going to go through the great tribulation, they would not be freaked out. Because Paul would have taught them that. They would have said, oh, everything is horrible right now. This must be the tribulation. Paul said we would go through the great tribulation. That's all. We're all good. We're not freaked out. We've been taught about these things. But what are they? They're freaking out. Because, why? You said we were going to get out of here. <laughs> you said that we were going to be raptured before that. And that's why they're distressed. Because they have been receiving lies from people, false news, that they had missed the rapture and that they're in the tribulation. So it's kind of a proof text to say that Paul taught that the rapture was going to happen before the tribulation. And so he tells them, hey... Don't freak out. He's going to clear things up. Verse 3. Let no one lie to you by any means. For that day, the day of the Lord, will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Now he says, you want to know what's going to be the kickoff to the day of the Lord? This is, how, this is the kickoff to the day of the Lord. It's going to be these, these two things. He's going to give them two things that are here. But remember, what is this day of the Lord thing? The day of the Lord. We hear it all. If you read the Bible from Genesis all the way to Revelation, you will see that phrase pop up over and over and over again. You'll see the phrase, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, especially in areas like Joel, Zephaniah, the minor prophets talk about it, Isaiah and Jeremiah. What is the day of the Lord? And it's not just mentioned by, by the name day of the Lord. It's it, the prophets, after the days of Joel and, and Zephaniah, they just refer to it as the day. It's just the day. And so you have not just the title, the day of the Lord, but also the subsidiaries of it, the, the allusions of it. Well, what is it? Now, it, we know a day is a 24-hour period for us Americans. It's a 24-hour time period from midnight to midnight. 24 hours, one day. The Jewish people have a day that is called evening and day. In Genesis, it says, in the first day, it says, in the evening and the morning were the first day. In the Jewish concept, they have a mentality that day starts at sunset. If you watch Fiddler on the Roof, right? You know that, you know, sunrise, sunset, that day, that day thing. But remember, they're all getting ready for Sabbath at sunset. When the wedding is, is going to happen, they do that after, after sunset. And that's the day. That's the start of the day. It's not midnight, the start of a new day. It's sunset is the start of their day. It starts off dark and ends with light. It starts off in darkness, and then the sunrise occurs, and it starts in light. You all get that? That's the Jewish day. So too, the day of the Lord will start with utter darkness, absolute horrific darkness, and it will culminate in light. Everybody got that? And so this day of the Lord, what is it? Is it a 24-hour time period? Well, when you read the scriptures, you realize it's not just a 24-hour day period. It's a long period of time. It's an age. There are ages that are talked about in Scripture. And the day of the Lord is one of those ages. It's a long period of time. It's a period of time that will last for a little bit over 1,000 years. And what is it, though? Well, when you look at it, we're going to do a whole timeline of this day of the Lord. What is it? How does it go down? Well, the first thing that you see, well, the first thing that's going to happen, we know, we've talked about it, is the rapture of the church. The rapture of the church is not part of the day of the Lord. The rapture of the church happens before the day of the Lord occurs. We know that the rapture of the church is just for us Christians who are born again. It's for the church. Read 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. We know that, it's going to, that rapture is going to be an unexpected but yet as the church expecting day. It's, uh, we don't know when it's going to occur. It's for the church. We know that the Bible tells us that Jesus will ascend or descend out of heaven and there will be a shout. There's going to be a voice like an angel. The trumpet of God shall sound. It's going to be loud and we're going to hear it. It's going to be loud to us. The dead in Christ 
will meet us in the air. The, it will be, the dead in Christ are rising first. And they'll meet us in the air, in the clouds, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up. That word in the, in the Latin is rapturos, caught up, harposa in the Greek. In the English, snatched away, raptured, caught up, quickly and violently. It's going to be loud. It's going to be quick. Will it hurt? No. That was, that was one of the sticking point, points that my son uh, brought up when he was younger. He goes, Dad, is it going to hurt? I mean, you know, when you snatch me away violently, it's never, it's never nice, you know? <laughs> is it going to hurt? I'm like, no, it's not going to hurt. It's going it, it, to be quick. It says it's going to be faster than a blink of an eye. And you're going to be doing your business. You're going to be mowing the lawn. You're going to be driving, well, hopefully you won't be driving the car, but you'll be doing something. It doesn't really matter. You're going to be eating. You're going to be watching TV. You're going to be catching up on your Netflix. I don't know what it is. Maybe, hopefully you'll be reading the Bible, praising the Lord. Maybe you'll be asleep. Don't know, but you'll be gone in a blink of an eye, quicker than a blink of an eye. And you'll be in the presence of the Lord, surrounded by the church, the saints that have gone before, and you'll be with him. And he says he'll take you away and you'll forever be with him. Andrew, that is the most, what are you, are, that is fantasy land. No, it's tomorrow land. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Well, how do you know? Because the Bible has never lied to me. The word of God has never lied. How in the world could the Bible lie about, uh, how, the, how in the world, world could the Bible lie to me now after it's been so faithful in times past? You're like, well, this is big. You know, when God came to the children of Israel and said, hey, I'm going to deliver you out of all your problems. You're going to walk through the waters. And I'm going to make paths for you in the sea. <laughs> Whatever. Oh, no, no. I bet they were like, wow, it's actually happening. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you through this. I'm going to bring you through that. I'm going to help you through that. And the word of God it was sp spoken to the Jewish people. And they're like, oh, I don't believe that. And then it, then it happened. Then for us. The Lord's saying, hey, there's going to be this thing called the rapture. And we just go, eh, sounds a lot of like fantasy. I don't, know. don't doubt it. Don't doubt it. He's, he, he, he can do this. If he can raise from the dead, if he can heal the, the sick, cure blind people, make lame walk, cure leprosy. <laughs> oh, if he can save a person like me from hell... Save a person like you from hell? The rapture is for real. And it's going to happen. Well, when? I don't know. It's, but I know it's going to come soon. Get ready, guys. But that's the rapture. When the rapture hits, the rapture hits, we're out of here. We're gone. Always be with the Lord. But then it starts the day of the Lord. That's when the day of the Lord starts. It's, it's marked by two major things that will go on. The themes of the day of the Lord is where God is going to pour his wrath out upon a Christ-rejecting culture and cursed world. He's going to deal with stuff. It's all those things that have not been dealt with. God the judge, the Lord. God and the, the three in one are going to work and judge this culture and cursed world where there's going to be a day of reckoning for every injustice where he's going to pour out his wrath upon the world. And it's just the beginning of it. It's a not a good time. It's a scary time. It begins in darkness and ends with light. But it's not good. And the second thing that's going to happen is God's going to work within God's chosen people in Israel. He made promises to the Jews that he will keep during this time. You're like, well, that's kind of strange. No, it's not. God's a promise keeper. He always keeps his promises. And he made a ton of promises to the nation of Israel that will be fulfilled. And it's, it's going to be... But the first things are mentioned here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let no one deceive you in verse 3. By any means, for the day will not come unless the falling away comes first. That's number one. What's the falling away? We'll get to it. What is this? And second, and the man of sin is revealed the son of perdition. That's the Antichrist. Those things shall be revealed. Those are the starting points. So what is this falling away? 
In the Greek, it's the word apostia, which means apostasy. The word there means defection, departure, separation. Now, there's some people believe that they believe that when they say the falling away, it means the rapture of the church. You can take it as that because it is a departure. It's a separation. It's a defection from this world to another. You can say that the falling away is the rapture. But the thing is, and this is interesting, every time this word is used in the Bible, apostia, it has to do with a total believing or a departure from truth. So either one works. But if you look at the context of Scripture, apostia simply means a walking away from the faith of truth of what God is, who God is, from good doctrine, from, from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's a walking away. It's a defection, a departure. In fact, the root word means divorce from the faith. Now, we have this right now. There are many people who are apostate who have walked away from the tr truth, walked away from the truth of Jesus Christ and have willingly said, I don't want anything to do with God and I reject it completely. But after the rapture, there's going to be something big that shows up. A real big apostasy. This is something that's different. What is this falling away? Well, we're going to look at it more later on in the chapter. And then the second thing that's going to happen, not just the apostasy, this falling away, this departure, this divorce. Secondly, the man of sin or perdition, lawlessness, this dude, whoever he is, we call him the Antichrist, will be revealed. He will come into view. He will be revealed. Notice, he will be revealed. That means you're going to see who he is. It's not that he's born. Sometimes people get into a a Hollywood movie mentality, mm -hmm. and they watch movies like The Omen or something like that, and they say, oh, the day of the Lord is when the Antichrist will be born. No. It's not the birth of the Antichrist. It's the revelation about who he is to the world. This is the man. This is the guy, this Antichrist. He's going to reveal himself, and he's going to be, well, who is this Antichrist guy? Uh, turn over to Revelation chapter 6. Who is he? Revelation chapter 6, we see his rise there at the beginning of the day of the Lord, what we call the tribulation. In Revelation chapter 6, we see these, um, John has these visions of these four horses of the apocalypse. Now, a lot of people say, what are they? Well, they're, they, you know, some people say, are they defensive linemen for Notre Dame? No. Uh, who are the four, you know, if you know your Notre Dame history, uh, uh, are they, are they uh, you know, are they signs? What are they? Well, the Bible's very clear about who they are. In fact, there's a new movie out uh, that, that, you know, called The Knock at the Door, and they talk about these are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. That's, I want you guys in all of your prophetic learnings of the Bible, divorce yourself from Hollywood. Okay? <laughs> Just drop all movies. And just say, well, it says in this movie, well, you know, hey, ask questions. Let that be a springboard for you. But remember, your best source of information about end times is the Bible. It's the book in your lap, okay? <laughs> Don't go away from that. Well, what about Left Behind? That novel series about a couple years back. E this is better than that. <laughs> Stick to the word. <laughs> Stick to the word, Okay. And so, with that said, who is this Antichrist the, who is named the son of perdition or the man of sin? In Revelation 6, this, the, these visions appear to John in the heavenly scene. I remember the book of Revelation is a timeline. It goes straight through. And so, in verse 6, you see it, it says, Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. Remember, there was a seal, a, a scroll that had seven seals on it. And every time a seal, a wax seal was broken... There was a judgment or some event that occurs on earth. And so the, the lamb, which is Jesus Christ, breaks the first seal. And I heard one of the four living creatures, which is an angel, saying with a voice like thunder, come and see. I love that about Jesus. He never hides things. He says, hey, check this out. Check this out. You know, it's not like, oh, we have a secret club of Christians. Now, we're only allowed to 
do end time stuff. No, no, there is no, like Peter says, there is no hidden interpretation. There is no hidden prophecy. Come and see, check it out. And I looked, and behold, no, there is one. There is a set of judgments that happen in the book of Revelation that Jesus says, you see them, John, but don't write them down. Don't talk about them. They're called the utterances. Isn't that scary? That just, thank God I'm not going to be here for this. Uh, there is one where he says, you know what? Just don't write those. Hold up. Hold up. They'll know when they are when they are. They'll, they'll know what that means. And so here he says, look, and I behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, like bow and arrow, but no arrows, just a bow. And a crown was given to him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. In the book of Revelation, this is the first time you see this guy. He, we see the rise of the Antichrist as the, one of the first events of the day of the Lord. And it's not just, a, it's a revealing of him. A lot of people spend time trying to figure out who the Antichrist is. In all honesty, don't waste your time on that subject. Why? Don't look for the king of this world, the Antichrist. Look for the king of kings and lord of lords. He's the one that we need to be looking for. He's coming in the clouds. This dude, don't even waste your time. Well, who is he? I want to know. Is it Elon Musk? No. <laughs> you know, is it, who is it? You know, and we start to guess who it is. You know, is it Trump? I remember when, back in the 80s, it, everybody was saying, it's, it's Reagan. It's Reagan. Reagan's the Antichrist. Well, how do you know? Ronald Wilson Reagan. Count his number. Ronald is six letters. Wilson is six letters. Reagan is six letters. 666. And it's in the name. I'm all like, no. And then he died. And I was like, see, it proved you wrong. It wasn't him. You know? And, and listen, all this stuff, all this stuff. Who is it? You know, when Obama was president, it was Obama. Uh, no, no, he's not smart enough. It, it's, it, it is. This guy is going to be insanely diabolical and smart. He's going to be something that the world has not ever, hasn't seen since the days of Rome. He is going to be so off the hook, just diabolically smart and cunning. It's demonic. Literally, it's not demonic. It's satanic. And that's who this guy is. It says first in here in, in Revelation 6 that it says that he comes on a white horse. What does that mean? He's going to come like a Messiah. Remember, Jesus comes on a white horse. The Antichrist is going to be Messiah-like. He's going to be the rescuer. Everybody's going to look at him as this coming king, as a Messiah that has all the answers. And it says that he comes with a bow, but no arrows. A bow in that culture was a conquering or an offensive weapon. But it says that he's not going to do it by force. We know from the book of Daniel, Daniel talks about the Antichrist a lot, that, that these ten horns will arise, ten countries will come up, and then out of the midst of them will come a little horn with a big mouth. He's going to just speak great words. He's gonna, the Antichrist is going to have all the answers. He's going to have a big mouth. And he's going to solve all the problems. He's going to be a, a leader. And all the world will bow down to his authority. He will be the global dictator of the entire earth. It's not just a local uh, guy who's going to control America or Europe. We know from the book of Daniel, there's a good chance that he'll come out of the European countries. By how it looks, and the, and and and, and the, well, we don't have time to get into it right now, but it's fascinating. He'll rise out of the European world, and he will take charge because he's so he his words, man, that guy, wow, it just sounds good. And notice a crown will be given to him. He doesn't take the crown. He doesn't take it by force. He says, "Give me my rulership." They will give him the rulership of the world. They'll say, you got the answers. You got the mouth. You're the Messiah. You're the Christ. Here it is. And they'll give him rulership. He'll rule the world. It says that, that it will be a, a, an empire that is cut up into ten sections. The whole world will be cut up into ten sections. And, and he'll rule them all. And then, get this, three of those will break away and rebel against the Antichrist. We don't know 
who they are, but they'll do it. And it will be a war. And that's what brings us to our next section. The second horse, it said, and he opened up the second seal, and I heard the second living creature say, come and see, in verse 3 of chapter 6 of Revelation. And he says, another horse, fiery red, went out. And it was granted to one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword, war. A war. Is this World War Three? Yeah, it might be World War Three. It might be World War Four. We have no clue. But it's a great world war. And that brings us to the third seal. And I opened the third seal. Or he opened, not John, but Jesus opened the third seal. And I heard a third living creature say, come and see. So I looked and behold, a black horse. And he who was sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and the wine. This is famine. There is no, there's going to be no food. There's going to be a, a worldwide famine and famine always follows war. And there it is, a famine in the land. And then the fourth seal was opened. And then the angel said, come and see. And in verse 8 it says, so I looked and behold, a pale horse. And the name of him who sat on it was death. And Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with a sword, with hunger and death, and by the beasts of the earth. So there, that fourth horse, the pale horse, is death. And the whole Start this world war is going to take out one fourth of the world's population. That's around two billion people. You're like, what kind of war will it be? Where is this going to happen? Who's the two billion people? I don't know. But it's going to be horrible. And that's just the start. Two billion of the eight billion people on planet Earth are going to die right out at the start as a result of the rise of the Antichrist. In verse, now back at 2 Thessalonians, we see his nature. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, it says, Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So notice his nature. He opposes and exalts himself. He opposes everything good, and he exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. He says, I will be the only one worshipped. During this time of the day of the Lord, we see the war starts. And if you look back at Genesis 6, you see that there is a tremendous upheaval of the earth during this time. The fifth seal is broken and there's a, a martyrs, those who do believe in God, those who are... Uh, who are believers and followers of Jesus Christ after the rapture of the church, those cry of the martyrs, they'll be killed off by the Antichrist in the world. And then the sixth seal is cosmic disturbances, where the uh, sun, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth, probably triggering volcanic ash. And behold, the moon became like blood. Now, if you guys lived through Mount St. Helens, you remember that's what kind of happened on a small scale. The stars of heaven fell from, to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs while it's shaken by a mighty wind. So it just, it just drops out of the sky, these stars. The sky receded as a scroll and is rolled up and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. Oh, that's impossible. Totally possible. With tectonic disturbance, we know that's totally possible. And the kings of the earth, the politicians, and the great men, and the rich men, and the commanders, and the mighty men, every slave and every free man, so every spectrum of the economic ladder, hid themselves in the caves and the rocks and the mountains, and said to the mountains and the rocks, fall upon us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? You're like, wow, that... The whole world's going to shake. But this is only the second earthquake, and this is the smaller one of the two. It's horrible. The earth is going to be in geological upheavals. We know that at this time that 144,000 people during this time of the Jewish world, Jewish young men who are virgins, never been married, will rise up from the nation of Israel 
as believers in Jesus Christ and become little miniature Billy Grahams and Greg Lorries. And they'll preach the gospel. We know that by the midpoint of the, uh, of the tribulation, all these guys will be dead and killed for their faith in Christ. It will be a great tribulation. The seventh seal is going to give you seven trumpet judgments. Trumpets will sh sound in heaven, and there'll be a judgment on earth. The first trumpet is... Uh, is um, the angel took fire, it says, and the seventh angel, so the first trumpet is going to be vegetarian, will be, uh, the vegetation, not vegetarians will be struck. <laughs> yeah, just kidding, no, no, vegetation will be struck. If you're a vegetarian today, you're like, oh, oh my gosh. You're like, my goodness, man, give me a burger, I'm going to dodge this bullet. No, uh, no, vegetation shall be struck, on, or a third of it, the trees and the grass will be burnt up, this the second trumpet, the seas will be struck. Uh, one third of the seas will turn into like blood because of these things falling from the sky. We believe will be meteors that will hit. You can read it yourself. Uh, verse 10 and 11, the third trumpet, the waters, the fresh water will be struck. One third of all fresh water will be gone. Uh, fourth trumpet, the, the sun will be struck by one third. The sun will actually be darkened by one third. Uh, and the and the and the, uh, the 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 stars in the sky, fifth trumpet. Then we get into the the demonic stuff, literal demonic stuff rising up out of the earth. Locusts from the bottomless pit that will bite and or sting, not bite but sting men. And these demonic locusts will come out of the pit of the Euphrates River. The sixth trumpet is an ange is a demonic army from the Euphrates River that will use three things to kill off. One third of mankind, fire, smoke, and brimstone will come out of their mouths. We don't know what that means, but it will kill. By, the, by this point, get this, one third of the world, a get more, will die. That's another two billion people. So by the half point of the tribulation, half of the world's population is dead. It's gone. Wow. That's insane. It gets worse and worse, more demonic and more demonic. Israel will be persecuted, and that gets you to the halfway point. The halfway point is when the Antichrist will go into the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. He'll walk in after being targeted for an assassination. He will be struck, he will be killed, and Satan will come in and raise his body up. He will have a wound on his right eye and on his right hand. And he will come back to life. People will worship him as God. And the Antichrist will come into the rebuilt temple, into the Holy of Holies. And Daniel talks about it. Jesus talked about it. A lot of people in the Bible talk about it. They call it the abomination of desolation. And the Antichrist will declare himself to be God and demand to be worshipped as God. And when that occurs, Jesus says in Matthew 24 and 25, when you see this go down, Run, you Jews, run. Don't even get a coat. Just take off because he's coming after you. And you thought Hitler was bad. This guy's going to be worse. He's going to come after the Jews. But God's going to protect a lot of the Jewish people and protect them and hide them divinely. But he's going to go there. And then and there's going to be a guy named the false prophet that will rise up. And he'll say, hey, worship him. They'll make an image a, a statue, an image, a picture. We don't know what this image is, but it will be demanded that you worship the image as well. It'll be set up in the temple in Jerusalem. And if you want, and, and this is the thing, and it will demand that the world receive a mark upon their hand or upon their forehead. And it's connected with the name of the Antichrist and the number of his name, 666. Now you're like, will it be 666? I doubt that. I don't know what the mark or the tattoo will be. Some people say it's a computer chip. Listen, I'm not too sure it's going to be a computer chip. I'm not even sure if, we're going to, if the world is going to have electricity by this time because of all the jacked up stuff in the world. But I'll tell you, it is called a mark, which if you look it up in the Greek, it's something on top of the skin. It's a mark. It's an identifier. You say, hey, I belong to the Antichrist. And remember, he's not going to be called Antichrist. We don't know what his name is. We don't know who this guy is. But he's not Mr. Antichrist, Okay. But we're going to have that, 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 that humanity is going to get a, a, a mark on their hand or their forehead to show allegiance. And if you don't take it, 
you will lose your head. Like, oh, come on. Decapitation? That never happens. It happens all the time in the culture. It still happens to this day. The last public execution of decapitation happened in 1978. That film of it. Guillotine, Paris, France. Oh, Paris? Well, they do a lot of crazy stuff in France. And that was, that was capital punishment back in the day. It wasn't that long ago. I mean, we know that certain uh, Middle Eastern cultures, the Southeast Asian cultures, still do this to this day. But that was, that's the punishment. Beheading. And then he'll go out, and then it just gets worse. The second half, we have the bold judgments, where everything is struck. The, the sun goes dark. Some people actually think it's supernovas, heat from the earth. Then a great earthquake will hit where uh, the whole earth is shifted in such a bad way. They think a polar axis shift where every island is gone, every valley is made into a mountain range, and every mountain range becomes a valley. It says in the scriptures that if God did not relent, will he find that he probably wouldn't find life on earth. And during this whole time of chaos, guess what's going on? The Antichrist is still trying to have power and rulership over the earth. The last war breaks out between those kings of the east, kings of the south, the kings of the north, and the Antichrist, the kings of the west. And they all get together in the nation of Israel in the valley of Armageddon, all the way down the Jezre uh, Jezreel Valley, the Jordan Valley, all the way to the Valley of Jehoshaphat, which is the Kidron Valley, outside of Jerusalem. And they fight it out there. And while they're fighting out, in the darkest of time, you think it's not going to get any worse, guess who shows up? Jesus Christ. It says that when he returns, it will be like lightning from the east is from the west. It's going to be the brightest thing on planet Earth because the sun is dark. And he's going to shine forth as the light. And there the day is broken. The night is done. And he takes little old Antichrist and little old false prophet, and he brings them into a new development he has for them called the Lake of Fire. And they become the first inhabitants of something called the Lake of Fire, which is not hell. It's something different. It's something designed for Satan and the demons, but they're going to be the first ones there. Satan is tossed into the bottomless pit, and he takes, and then when he lands, it says that the, the Mount of Olives will split from north to south, and a spring will gush forth and bring life. For around 75 days, the scripture says, he will judge the nations, separate the sheep from the goats. Those people that served him and did not take the mark, he's going to bring them in. The Jewish people he brought into this new kingdom he's starting on earth. Jesus will reign from earth. And we, the church, will rule and reign with him. We're locked in, the bride of Christ. And so as he settles the scores, as he brings to justice those who've taken the mark, he'll cast them out. And then he casts Satan into the bottomless pit. And then he transforms all of nature. Nature is junked up. The whole earth is trashed. And he brings it and makes it into a garden again. He takes the instruments of war and turns them into plowing and farming equipment. He beats their swords into plowshares. And then we go into this time called the thousand-year reign of Christ on earth. And man, you're like, well, what happened to the day of the Lord? This is the day part of the day of the Lord. We're st you're still in it? Yeah, this is the day of the Lord. This is it. And we rule and reign on, with Christ on earth for those thousand years. Everyone who survived that did not take the mark will live in this kingdom. And they'll live and not die. And they will marry. They will have kids. And they'll kids, they'll have kids. And they'll repopulate the planet. How many people will survive? I don't know. But the people who did not take the mark will enter in. Be like, what about us? Do we get married? No, no, we're the bride. We're married. We're married to Jesus, man. We're connected to him. We're, we're a totally different status, a totally different tax bracket, <laughs> if you want to say all of that. We're in a totally different world. Uh, not world, but a totally different area. We're not going to be, we're, we're, we're not like that. We're ruling and reigning with Christ. We have our job as the church, and we're going to be very, very stoked about that. For a thousand years, there's going to be forced righteousness on planet Earth. Sin will not be allowed. But with all these new people being born, God gives every human chances. He always gives a chance. 
And so he gives at the last, at the last of the thousand year reign, he lets the other decision come back out. Satan. He releases him. And guess what Satan does? Satan does what Satan does. And he goes out and he starts a rebellion against God. And people will follow him. What in the world? It happens. You read about it in Revelation, the last part. And the Lord will stop this rebellion on earth. And then he'll say, that's it. Let's clear the books. And he'll open the book of life called the Great White Throne Judgment. And everyone who has ever rejected the Lord, rejected God, lived for themselves, whose name is not written in the book of life, he will judge that day. Not us. We're good, church. Those people who stayed loyal to the Lord and faithful to him, this is not for us. This is for the wicked. And he will judge on that great white throne. This is still the day of the Lord. And all those who have in times past and that day have rejected Jesus Christ will stand before judgment of God and they will be cast into the lake of fire. Then Satan himself and all the demons will be cast into the lake of fire. And then death itself, the curse, will be thrown into the lake of fire. Praise the Lord. That would be a good one. Satan will be... I, I'm, I'm looking forward to that guy being, you know, dunked. You know, just like, boom. Satan's out of here. That would be a good day. And justice will reign. All the injustice will finally get dealt with. And then the day of the Lord is over. It's over. And then he starts all over again. A new heaven and a new earth. You're like, well, what happens after that? That's where the book ends, dude. That's it. That's the day of the Lord, the whole time. Wow. And in verse 5 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, hold on, guys, we've got nine more minutes. We might go a little bit longer, but, you know, brace yourself. In verse 5, it's 2 Thessalonians, it says, do, Paul says to them, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? He goes, this is just a refresher course. Same thing with you guys. For some of you, this is a refresher course. Some of you, this is the first time you ever heard about this type of stuff. I encourage you to go deeper. And in verse 6, he says, And now you know what is restraining, that he may re be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. The mystery of lawlessness is at work, even now, in this world. It's the spirit of Antichrist. John calls it that. What's the mystery of lawlessness? Well, it's here on this earth. It's going on, but there's something that restrains lawlessness. Outright, absolute, uh, unbridled, unchecked wickedness. There's something restraining it. And what is the restrainer of verse 6 and 7? It's the Holy Spirit in the church. It's us. It's the Holy Spirit in us, in the church, and when we do our work. The church, the Holy Spirit-filled believers, that's what it means to be a Christian, is if the Holy Spirit's inside of you that you confess your sins, giving your life to Him. The Holy Spirit's in us, and the Holy Spirit in the church, we stand against wickedness. It's, not, it's more than morals. It means there is no lying. We stand against lies. We stand against perversions. We, stand, we preach the gospel message. We stand against things like abortion, the abject killing of millions and millions of children. We stand against injustice. We stand against hate. We stand against, we stand against homosexuality, transsexualism, sex before marriage, drugs, drinking, racism, hate. We stand against it all. We're the ones on the front line that says, no. Oh, you fuddy daddy Christian. What makes you? Hey, it's the Holy Spirit in us. Well, I see churches that don't stand up against that type of stuff. Guess what? The Holy Spirit ain't in them. <gasps> You're judging. Nope. I'm doing what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7. I'm making a fruit call. You shall know them by their fruits. And dude, their fruits are pretty wormy. It's pretty bad. We stand against unrighteousness. 
And we, and why? Because the Holy Spirit's in us. We can't help it. No, that's wrong. That's not right. Now, we're not supposed to be, remember, what, how do we stand against it? With the gospel. The loving truth that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That's it. We don't have to be going there and says, let me tell you something. You're going to burn in hell and I hate your guts. And No. It's a love thing. I'm going to tell you about Jesus. There's a way out of it. God could change your heart. God could change your life. He could give you a better life to live. Why don't you just surrender to him right now? I love you. Jesus loves you. He can free you. He freed me. He can free you. And that's how we come against it. But it says here that the restrainer, the Holy Spirit in the church, is going to be, look what it says, taken out of the way. That means moved. That's the rapture. We're going to be moved out. And once we are raptured, once we're moved out of the way, that restraining force will be gone. Now, the Holy Spirit will not be out of, the, out of the world. The Holy Spirit will still be working in the world. But that restraining force that we as the church does will be gone. We'll be raptured. And it will be wickedness run rampant on earth during that, those days of the Lord. The Spirit still has a job in the day of the Lord. But the Spirit-filled believer in the church will be removed or moved to heaven. Nothing to hold wickedness back. And in verse 8, And then the lawless one who will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Guess what? This, this is the light part. This is the good part. He will be taken out of the way. He will be, take, he will be revealed and then he will be killed, the Antichrist. The coming of the lawless one in verse 9 is according to the working of Satan. So what about the Antichrist? It's the work of Satan. With all power, signs, and lying wonders, so he's going to have a great show. He's going to have a lot of lies. But get this, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love, the truth, that they might be saved. Get this, guys. The coming of the Antichrist is a work of Satan. But those who rejected the gospel, those who rejected the gospel, look at this, verse 11. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. This might be those who are left behind. Those who are left behind who, like it says here, but did not believe truth, but, in, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The those who are left behind will be forced with something called the strong delusion. Those who did not give their life to the Lord or who were living a lie, fake Christians, ones who didn't have the Holy Spirit, those people will be left behind. There will be people that call themselves Christians that will be left behind in the rapture because their hearts are not given over to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a scary thought. You're like, well, what if that's me? Well, have you? Have you given your life to Jesus Christ? Have you surrendered to him? Are you working out your own salvation? Are you, when you sin, do you say, God, forgive me? Is there a seriousness about sin? Do you want to change? Even though you're struggling with it, is there a fight to it? It, it, have you given your life over to him? Are you freed? Are you born again? Have you asked Jesus to forgive you? Do you give him your thoughts, your time, your life? Do you love him? If, if that you're born again. If you've done that, if you've given over, if you've surrendered, and you received him by grace through faith, if you've done that, you are born again. But if you haven't, if you just said the words and you didn't believe it in your heart, if you didn't really surrender completely to him, you're not. And then there are those who will say this phrase. Well, you know, when I see the rapture of the church occur, then I'll get serious about the things of God. I've seen that before. Have you ever met somebody like that before? Oh, if I see that rapture go down, then I'll get serious. Then I'll follow Jesus after the rapture. I don't have to be the church. 
I can just be one of those lowly people that survive. Oh, you know, when the tribulation hits, I'll go off grid. I'll go off grid. They'll never find me. I'll just live off the land. Well, how can you do that? Because half, if, you make it through the half, if you make it through the half point, the land is going to be burnt up with fire. Uh, there won't be any water. Uh, you, you, well, I'll just go on the boat. It's going to be full of blood. How? How? You tell me. How? You know, I know you might be Bear Grylls or whatever that dude is, that survivalist. You're not that good. I'll just live off the grid. I know you won't. You know? Or you might say this. Well, I'll just die a martyr's death, and I just won't take the mark, and they can chop my head off. I have a question for you. If you can't live for Jesus now, what makes you think you'll die for him then? You're so full of malarkey. I, I can't, as Joe Biden said, you're so full of it. Guys, you are so off your rocker. If you know anybody like that, just grab him by the scruff of the neck and says, are you that dumb? What are you thinking? Well, I'll just get killed. No, if you can't live for him now, what makes you think you'll die for Jesus in the tribulation? That is baloney. If you, listen, you might, if you're born again Christian, you're going to go into rapture. If you have Jesus, if you have the blood applied, the Holy Spirit in your heart, but if those people who are left behind, there's a 50-50 chance that this verse means that they will never come to the Lord that they might believe a strong delusion. And the falling away that's mentioned in verse 3 is about them. And that they will never come to the Lord. Now, we do see people get saved in the tribulation. There are those who will come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Those are tribulation saints. We see them all over the scriptures in the book of Revelation. But they're not the church. We're the church. They won't be. Their tribulation saints. There's a different status for them. They're unclothed, waiting to be clothed with, 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 oh, with a, a heavenly body. They're not, they're not there. They're not there. They're different. They're kind of in a, in a separate area. But you, I'll just be one of those people. We don't know if you get left behind, if you rejected the Lord. There might be a chance that you will never Come to the Lord if you get left behind. Is that possible, Pastor Andrew? Sure is. I don't know if that's going to be the case or not. I'm not sticking around to find out. This is the thing, guys. You're like, well, I don't know what to do. I know what you do. Give your life to Jesus Christ right now. If you know people who do not know Jesus Christ, surrender. If you are right now away from Jesus Christ, Come back to him right now. Clear it up. Just clear it up. Just say, God, I'm, I know I'm a sinner. Forgive me for my sins. Wash me and cleanse me. I just want to get right with you. Don't, don't wait. Today is the day of salvation. There are certain things that you're never supposed to take a chance on. If you go to an airport and you get on an airplane and you see oil dripping from one of the engines, don't get on it. If you go onto a boat and you see water, bubbling up into the compartment. Don't get on the boat. If you get into a car and see that it's driven by my mother, don't get in there. <laughs> <laughs> you know. You know, you know. Don't do it. And in all seriousness, guys, here you are at the dawn of eternity the dawn of the day of the Lord. And we're at the cusp of it. Don't fool around. You see the signs? Don't fool around. If you've been dealing with stuff and you've been fighting sin, that's great. But if you've just been living a lie, confess your sins. Come to Him. Make sure of your salvation like it says in the Scriptures. Don't mess around with these things. Be sure as not that you are going to heaven. Make sure that you are in that position where you are just born again. Surrender to Jesus Christ. Given to him. There's no greater thing. He sets you free. Live for him. Why well, really struggle with sin, Andrew? We all do. But he forgives us. 
Become his child. Surrender. Make him Lord. Make him the God of your life. And if you are saved, hold on. Jesus is coming back for us. Thank God we don't have to go through this. And the part of the day of the Lord that we do show up at, it's the day part. We come at the sunrise. When he returns, in the, when he returns and sets foot on the, on the Mount of Olives, it says that his bride will return with him. And he, behold, he comes with 10,000 of his saints. But I will tell you one thing. It's when I study things like this, I just, my heart goes out to the lost. Gosh, dog. It puts a fire under me to tell people about Jesus Christ. Yesterday was my anniversary. Had a great, you know, 17 years of, of marital bliss. Praise the Lord. Went to Conroy's over in Lakewood to get some flowers for Kelly. And I went in there and I just started talking and I was just joking around with the flower ladies. And she goes, why are you so happy? I said, oh, that's Jesus Christ. It's just Jesus, man. She's like, uh-oh. <laughs> it's one of those. I said, that's just Jesus. I said, man, he just saved. He goes, have you ever been this happy? I said, well, you know, without Jesus, I'm pretty, pretty mean. I, but he changed my life. And he could change your life if you just surrender to him and give him your life and ask him to forgive you of your sins and believe on him with all your heart. You could have the same joy and happiness that I have right now. And, oh, thank you for my flowers, you know? <laughs> That's how easy it is. Let's let the Spirit move in your life. And you see these people. And you just get, it's depressing. And you're just going, oh, Lord, get a hold of them. Who, how are they going to hear if we don't speak up? The greatest thing that you can do right now is pray for the lost and speak to the lost about Jesus Christ. Whoever comes into your little circle, whether it be a, a lost wife or a lost husband, uncle, hit your family first. That's your Jerusalem. Tell them about Jesus and be unashamed about it. Well, what if they get mad? Then let them get mad and then cook them dinner and be nice to them and just make sure and just tell them. Remember, salvation isn't based upon your work ethic. It's based upon what Jesus did on the cross. Amen? So you do what you are called to do is be a voice and let the Holy Spirit take care of the rest. But these are the days, guys. These are the days that we have to start talking to people about Jesus and letting people know. And be happy about it. It's the, it's the greatest thing in the world. It's the most joyful thing in the world. If you want to do that today, hey, go out with the Go team today at, at noon. Go out with those guys. Go out with Brad and Olga, the, the team. Go out there. Tell people on 2nd Street. Hand out tracts. Pray with people. Tell people that Jesus loves them. Watch what the Lord does. Time is short. And that's some good stuff. Amen? Isn't his word just sufficient? Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just thank you so much for your word. We ask that you would just, uh, Lord, quicken the days, Lord. But Father, you know that there are many who don't know you yet. We ask that you, by your spirit, would move upon the hearts of people that need you. Father, we ask that you would just uh, soften the heart of the lost. Get into you, Lord Jesus. We ask for victory. We ask that Satan would be shut up, that his grip upon the hearts of people would loosen and the grip of your nail-scarred hands would get a hold of their heart right now. Lord, do a work. Fill us with your spirit. And we look forward to the day that we can be with you in the clouds, raptured. And Lord, we ask that before we rapture, that we would get a hold, that you would get a hold of it through us, Lord, those many people, those many people, that need you. And that you would save them from this great and dreadful day of the Lord. We love you, Lord. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand, guys. Jesus loves you. He's coming back soon. I love you too. Never forget that. Find someone today, just one person to tell about Jesus Christ. I, del I double dog dare you. Just find one person and it will be a joy. Watch what happens, okay? Just think of that. We got around, you know, 50 people here or so. Just imagine if you go out and you tell 50 people to hear the gospel. What if you do two? That's 100. Or what if you do three? I don't know. I don't know math that far, but you, you get it. 
It's all good, all right? And let the spirit move. You won't regret it, amen? God bless you guys. Tyler, let's worship the Lord. Blessed be your